Bonjour et... Hello, my name is Yannick Leblanc, anchor at Téléjournal Acadie. Welcome to CBC Radio-Canada's annual public meeting. I will co-host this evening, which is broadcasted on the web from the TF Edmonton. And this is CBC Radio Canada's eighth annual public meeting here from Moncton, New Brunswick. And I know there are people who are joining us on the web from coast to coast to coast. It's great for me to be back home. I grew up about a half an hour away in Sackville, New Brunswick, lived there from the time I was 11 months old until I graduated from Mount Allison University. My first radio job was in nearby Amherst, Nova Scotia, and my first CBC job I really shouldn't admit this publicly, but it was back in 1981 at CBC in Moncton. So it is great to be back here. You're going to have uh, an opportunity to hear from some of your favorite CBC and Radio Canada personalities, a panel discussion about the importance of digital media for those of us at CBC Radio Canada. And uh, we're also talking about strengthening our relationship with our uh, public, with our shareholders, with those of you who are here in Moncton and those of you who are watching across the country. And uh, it's important that you take part in that conversation. Mm. I'd like to welcome everyone here. Thank you for coming here. And also, I would like to point out that we have board members of Radio Canada, CBC, and senior management are here today. So thank you for being here. As I was saying earlier, there'll be a question period. We'll discuss opportunities. Uh, in the digital age, where we have unlimited content, what's the role of a public broadcaster within this new digital era? And we'll have a question period afterwards, which should last about 30 minutes with the board members of CBC. Those of you who are watching from across the country on the webcast, you can email us at uh, APM, that's for annual public meeting, at cbc.ca. And you can also tweet questions using the hashtag CBCAPM. You can interact, as I was saying. You can keep your phone on, on mute. But to send questions, it's hashtag CBC APM and at home, you can send us questions on all our platforms. You can do so by email at APM or CBC APM. You can participate in our debate. And let's uh, invite up to the front of the stage the chair of CBC Radio Canada's board of directors, Rami Racine. So welcome to our annual public meeting of CBC Radio Canada. I'm delighted to see so many people gathered here in Moncton in this wonderful hall. And I'd like to thank also the people from around Moncton. I thank, I thank everyone at home who's watching us. As you know, the theme is public broadcasting in the digital era, seizing all opportunities. Let's talk together about the future of CBC Radio Canada together. Personally, I feel confident about this future. This fall, we launched a new season with a bang at CBC Radio Canada. Our special broadcast, En Direct de Niver, with Céline Dion, drew over 1,170,000 viewers. This was our best... Uh, this was our best um, show in the last 10 years. We also have a new daily series, District 31, which has caught the attention of over 850,000 viewers uh, since our first broadcast. So this follows up well with Virginie, which attracted about 800,000 viewers, and Trente Vie, which on average had about 650,000 people watching. On CBC side, the second season of Still Standing continues to showcase Canada's small towns, while Kim's Convenience, which premieres on October 2nd, will take us to Toronto following a Korean-Canadian family running a convenience store. Our enlightening current affairs shows are still there, including L'Heure du Monde on ICI Radio Canada Première. And we're back with our second season with Someone Knows Something. One of our most popular podcasts on iTunes 
in Canada and in the U.S. It's another example of the incredible reach of digital. Acadian entrepreneurs know something about this. We, we launched a portal a year ago, Acadzi Inc., showcasing the region's top companies and business leaders. It's inspiring to see the progress we've made to adapt to the shifting media landscape. We launched a digital focus strategy to keep pace with Canadian changing media habits. And two years later, we, are, we can already see some tangible results. I'd like to say hello to my fellow board members here in Moncton and thank them for their contribution to this strategy for the future. They hail from all parts of Canada and share the de determination to make CBC Radio Canada the public space of tomorrow. Un espace encore plus dynamique et numérique. An even more dynamic and digital space where Canadians can go to get informed, enlightened, entertained, and gather and discuss and debate. I'd like, of course, to thank all our talented staff who have talent, they have vision and passion, and I see them work every day, and they work, enabling us to go through this transformation while continuing to produce world-class content. Naturally, we shouldn't underestimate the obstacles that still lie ahead. And unfortunately, they are considerable. But what's important is to recognize that there's a place in the, the digital age to have a national public broadcaster to tell Canadian stories. So obviously, to talk about this, I would ask now my colleague and friend, the president and CEO, Hubert Lacroix. Good evening, everyone. Yves Dama. Obviously, I'm very pleased and very pleased to be with you this evening. Mrs. Leblanc. Leblanc, Mr. Leblanc, member for Moncton. You know, in June 2014, we initiated our digital shift to deepen our relationship with all Canadians. Moncton is a microcosm of Canada's cultural and linguistic diversity. We understand its importance. This is why we invested in our services here, and now we have state-of-the-art facilities. In fact, 800 people, 800 people, I say, from the four Atlantic provinces came to visit us during our open house event on September 10th. Like you, we feel strongly about our new station in Moncton, which serves all of Atlantic Canada, and through the networks, the country as a whole. And every time we invest in a regional station to provide more local content, more often, and on more screens, we build on our expertise. In the last couple of years, we've transformed our stations in Saskatoon, Rimouski, Halifax, Matan, and Sudbury. And we built all of this collective expertise and know-how into Moncton. Safe to say that Moncton is now one of our most modern, multi-platform stations in the country. We realize the important place that CBC Radio Canada holds in your lives. And this evening, I'd like to share my vision for ensuring that it remains that vibrant public space in the future. 27 mois. 27 months after launching our 2020 strategy, we are past the disruption stage, and now we focus on solutions. We are seizing all opportunities offered by digital to tell your stories on the platform of your choice. Therefore, we can say that our digital is also deeply local. An example. An example. Alors que nous étions en pleine couverture. While we were in the thick of the Olympic coverage, we allowed audiences around the globe to experience the Grand Tantamar from Karakit virtually through Facebook. The webcast became 
a national sharing event because over 140,000 Acadians living everywhere around the world were able to celebrate remotely with the people in Kaiket. A great example, actually, this Facebook Live Saint Amar coverage, confirming that with digital, local content can now reach national and even international audiences. The CBC Maritime investigative unit gave another prime example of this last month with its report into the inappropriate use of force at the Dorchester Pen. The RCMP have since confirmed that they are reopening the criminal investigation into the death of the inmate, Mr. Matthew Hines, which happened in May 2015. This report was shared on all of our platforms and reached Canadians across the country. More than 278,000 of you viewed the content online on CBC News. In fact, each week, the CBC New Brunswick site generates 1.4 million interactions. Et à l'échelle nationale, plus de And nationally, more than 16 million Canadians use our digital platforms. It is a three million increase over the last year. Notre objectif Our goal de voir ce chiffre grimper is to see that number climb to $18 million Here's also in the same by day. the year 2020 at CBC. We brought together Canadians at home and in 150 public places across the country and even abroad to celebrate the iconic Canadian rock band, the Tragically Hip. Over 11.7 million Canadians watch the group's farewell concert from Kingston, broadcast on TV, radio, the web, and our apps. Ici à Moncton, 500 personnes. Here in Moncton, 500 people gathered at the Capitol Theatre for one of our official screenings. Theatre management actually thanked us for sharing this Canadian moment with the entire country saying it was exactly what a national public broadcaster is supposed to do. We will continue to build on this momentum. Last spring, the government announced a major reinvestment in CBC Radio-Canada, the first of its kind in over a decade. It's a powerful vote of confidence in the value of what we do and in our 2020 plan. Grâce à cet appui, Thanks to this support, we will continue to grow our web team in, in, in Acadia, doubling our staff assigned to the web. And we have added three new people assigned to digital coverage, coverage and converted a producer position to focus entirely on digital. EC Radio Canada Acadie will therefore cover regional affairs 18 hours a day, seven days a week. You can now also personalize your news feed and headlines. And it's this additional support which will allow us to extend the season of Méchant Soirée on Radio Canada by adding five new episodes. And I'll take this opportunity to thank Samuel. Where are you, Samuel? Yes, Samuel Chasson, please rise. Who hosts Méchant Soirée. Pour la tournée de son équipe dans les écoles secondaires francophones de la région, dans le cadre... For his team's tour of French language high schools in their region, this initiative shed new light on the issues facing young people today, such as being a teenager, in the digital age. In notre projet, prochaine génération, the next generation, announced a two semaines, launched two weeks ago, fits, fits with this. We will bring together 20 young Canadians within a team, manage that they will self-manage, and their mission will be to develop new, new projects. These millennials will define their public broadcaster for their generation and will accelerate our transformation. You'll see their contribution starting 
de 2017. In 2017. It's a project that fits well with the competition that we've had in Radio Canadien, Jeune Reporter Acadien, which teaches the basics of journalism to six grade 10 or 11 students and helps them produce their own reports. We actually need to develop this reflex of getting young people involved in creating and sharing their own content. And we need to trust them with the keys to the car. And beyond this younger generation, we have to open up to all of those who are looking to help us rethink the way we do business. Yes, we can rejoice in the fact that our vision and our digital shift were the right ones. And yes, we are supported by new investments. But it's just as critical that the Canadian media ecosystem also adapt to this new digital reality. Voilà pourquoi. This is why it's important that the government launches its current consultations on Canadian content in a digital world. We look forward to participating, and I encourage all of you to do so because it is our culture that is at stake. Diversity is our strength in Canada. We need to reflect it. We need to embrace it. That's what we will do in 2017 when we celebrate Canada's 150th birthday. And true to our role, we will bring Canadians together to experience this signature national event. Et pour vous donner un avant-goût de to give you an overview of what awaits you next year, please watch with me this short video. Finally, I also wanted to remind you that you will find our financial reports on cbcradiocanada.ca and that we will be happy to answer your questions after our panel discussion. Merci et bonne assemblée publique. Thank Annette. you and have an excellent meeting. Merci beaucoup, Hubert. Thank you very much, Hubert. This ends the introductory part of our annual public meeting. The meeting I got from that whole presentation was from the video. It's our prediction that the Habs are going to win the Stanley Cup, I think is what, yep. yeah. Yep. Excellent. That's good. It's going to be a and good year. Canada's going to win against Europe tonight. <laughs> That's right. Alors, uh, maintenant, on va passer. Now we'll go to, on, we'll move on to our discussions about how the digital world changes the way we work. We have some people like Samuel, who are here today, and we'll invite these personalities to participate at this, a discussion where we'll talk about uh, opportunities in this digital era, the role of a public broadcaster within this ever-changing context. And through our discussions, we'll learn more about CBC Radio Canada's initiatives to reach out to people and to Alors, evolve over time. It is an interesting group of people and we had the opportunity, the privilege in fact, to sit there in the green room and speak to them. They work in different media, they work in different cities for the CBC and when you get a group like that together, you have discussions on serious topics like, well, what, what did we talk about? Whether Saint Hubert or uh, Swiss Chalet were better chicken, right? That was, uh, <laughs> that actually got a little ugly, that uh, conversation. And also we had an, an equally heated debate on whether you swipe left or swipe right on Tinder. 
Yeah. We don't know what the answer we is to that. We don't know Tinder. On connaît pas l'application Tinder, alors on sait pas. Puis we don't know Tinder, and someone in the group seemed to know something about this app, but didn't want to admit it. On va comme at any rate, uh, nos présentations. We'll start introducing the one who came the furthest away to participate in our discussions. Perhaps you don't know, but it's someone who started at. Atlantic Jean-François Bélanger started at Radio-Canada Atlantique, but since 2014, he is our foreign correspondent in Paris, but he went throughout the world. He was in Africa, in Moscow. He covered all sorts of crises, maybe in Haiti, in Sri Lanka, in Afghanistan, the Gaza Strip. You saw some of his work on the Acadie so I would invite uh, Jean-François to join us. So welcome, Jean-François. Thank you. Since he arrived at Radio-Canada in 2013, Karine Godin has worked as a journalist, quickly was the host of the Téléjournal Acadie on weekends, and she was also responsible with team assignments, both web and radio teams. Elle a demandé de retourner she has to go back uh, in the field because uh, she was missing it. She always brings us great stories, new stories. She's very curious and inquisitive. She brings us lots of uh, topics. Karine, welcome. You can hear, see, and all her work on all our platforms at Radio-Canada Acadie. And I'd like to introduce our colleague... New Brunswick from the Supper Hour News, Harry Forrestell, originally from St. John, New Brunswick, and he has traveled the world representing this corporation, including as a business reporter based in London, uh, filed for the National many, many times, and those of you who are in New Brunswick who watch CBC see him each evening at 6 o'clock. Harry Forrestell, join us, please. Samuel Chasson. Samuel Chasson who's now the host of Méchante Soirée and also Méchante Journée. He's been working for many years at CBC as a radio host. He's done many things. He was the host of the Numéricain who really brought us to how the Internet is changing people's lives. And even though he's not that young, he's our link with young people because young people talk to him. They identify with him. Samuel Chasson. Please join us. And we'd like to welcome Sonali Karnik, who is the host of All in a Weekend on CBC Radio 1, as well as Our Montreal on uh, CBC Television in Quebec, reporting locally and nationally on all kinds of major sporting events. She's promising not to check her phone repeatedly if this extends into the beginning of the World Cup game, as Canada, as you said, we've predicted will win tonight against Team Europe. And among her many uh, experiences covering big stories, one that will be of particular interest tonight, given the, the nature of our conversation, is being in Rio, covering the women's soccer team and, uh, and getting incredible feedback. You said instantly, almost, in fact, in fact, uh, when you sent out uh, digital tweets and that sort of thing. So uh, very uh, germane to what we're going to be talking about uh, this afternoon. So uh, join us, please, Sonali. Hello, chers colleagues, bienvenue. Dear colleagues, thank you for participating in these discussions. And as he's the first one, the one that came from the furthest, uh, Jean-François, Jean we'll start with the subject now with unlimited content where people get more and more information through Facebook and visit various sites. We don't know if the information is accurate or not. What is the role and the pertinency of Radio-Canada in this world? The answer is a multiple one to that question because, in fact, it's a challenge which we all face because our world is changing. It's true for everyone in the media and also for the written for a journal of newspapers. But it's a great opportunity also, first of all, to create new links with our audiences because we have feedback before we would do a broadcast. It would be like a bottle sent in the ocean. And now 
there's interaction right away sometimes. Our message is not well received or well perceived. So it's a great opportunity, I believe. Also, there are some new risks because, for instance, from the moment where, first of all, social media, it's a source of information for us. Twitter is faster because we saw it in Nice with those who witnessed the terrorist attack on the 14th of July. It's the people around the neighborhood who could take pictures and send them back. And it was a real challenge also to check, of course, our sources. But we have more information sources, of course, we work as journalists and apply our experience as journalists to this, uh, these new sources of information. But it's a wonderful medium with social media. Yes, we can broadcast on Facebook, for instance, and reach a whole new generation. They're not viewers. They're on the net. There's a new link. But our challenge and the real question is that from the moment that anyone can decide to broadcast something. My neighbor could decide that he'll be on Periscope or Facebook Live and broadcast an event. But people may wonder, well, why then do we have CBC? What do you bring? Well, yes, there are many sources of information. And I think people need uh, a point of reference. It's a bit like a ship in a storm, there are a lot of waves, people seem that uh, they're, be, they're drowning in information from various sources. And I believe CBC is very, very relevant because we, we, are, we are there, we transmit the information, yes, but our criteria, our standards as journalists don't change. So when we're facing a new generation, those who, per, in, per instance, uh, like uh, qu peut conspiracies and et cetera, can we believe it? Well, what's the reality? Is there one truth? I think it's very important that CBC be there to be a, to be a compass to show us, you know, because we will remain a reference and we'll remain a beacon. What's happening in the world right now? I think I think people take the first line, the first sound bite, and think it's true. That's why this logo is important. Before we called it Radio Canada's or CBC's uh, pizza, but I like the idea of a beacon. When you see CBC's logo, seeing as we see it. We have to make sure that the people can trust us and rely on what we're telling them on our information. That's why this logo will become more and more important. When you see the logo, you see CBC, ah, we can trust it. That will be very important in the years to come when it comes to social media. What's happening now is the next time there's a big event, in, we're going to watch you on Radio Canada, and I'm going to watch your neighbor on Periscope, and we're going to compare <laughs> and see who does the, the more interesting job. Uh, Sonali, you were talking to us in the green room about your digital experience mm -hmm. covering the Olympics in Rio. Talk a little bit about that. Well, it almost changed the way that I reported because uh, we wanted to get everything out uh, first to social media so people could see it. And then on your newscasts or on the website, you'd see the story, the report that I was putting together. Well, you know, some of those games, and all of them that I covered were exciting, <laughs> the ones that I were at. And so that's what you wanted to see. So luckily, we have a great digital team that was able to uh, tweet out or put out on Facebook those moments of the games that were the most exciting. So I'm not sitting there describing the game and missing the game in front of me. I'm not describing what's going on and missing this. So I could actually focus on the story and the journalism and the game. And uh, I was able to get out those exciting moments. And with the team that we had together, we were able to get the interview clips after the game, push them out to all the stations, to everyone, so they would all have access as soon as the game was over. So once those were out, people were reacting. I mean, you saw Coach John Herdman after Canada won the bronze medal, who was just exhausted and speechless. And with that fantastic sort of very British thing that he said, he said, we're buggered, they're buggered, but at least we won. Um, <laughs> And that was something that everybody got to see 
like live. It was broadcast live in the mix zone when we get where we get to talk to the players after the game. And that helps me afterwards form my story. So this has already been out there. How do I present this story to you now? Um, so it changed the way that I think of how I'm putting things out and the information that you probably already have seen or the, that you already have access to. Um, it was a great help to us actually and it really helped just my thought process of, of what you want to hear and what you want to see now. You want something new. You don't want to hear what we already just put out there. Um, so it, it really just changed everything about the, about the way we work. It, it's, really, it's really about closing the gap between the consumer of media, the consumer of information, and, and what we do in our day jobs. Closing the gap and opening the process so that people can not only see how the news is put together, uh, how we do our jobs, but can actually help us and, and take part in it. Um, a few years ago, we launched the Breaking News Desk on News World, and I was the first breaking news reporter in that modified role. And I described it as being like building a watch. You look at a watch, you can tell the time. You open the back of it, you can see what drives the hands. It's a far more interesting view. And we were trying to do that with the Breaking News Desk, uh, at News World to bring viewers into the process. So they understood the decisions we made, the editorial de decisions we made, and the steps we took to get to that final story that you would see on the national or on your evening news. In a similar way, uh, social media and our interaction with viewers has allowed them to take part in the process of developing stories and to tell us what they want to hear, the questions they want asked. We had our provincial premier take part in a radio interview for an hour and a half this week that was uh, broadcast on Facebook Live. So we were able to accept questions from all across the province and let uh, voters and New Brunswickers ask the questions of the premier and demand the answers. So it's made for a much richer environment as a journalist to work in. Karine, uh, Jean-François parle de du phare. Jean-François is talking about uh, the beacon and uh, Sonali is talking about the immediate response of the media and that changes her way of working and it, it, how we want to keep standards, how we work on different platforms. There's the speed, the twitting and all that. How do we do to maintain our uh, standards in a context like this. Yes, obviously, as a reporter, as media, Radio-Canada, we want to be the quickest. We want to be there. But as Jean-François said, we always have to check our facts. And as Samuel said, uh, the Radio-Canada logo helps for this. Uh, we promise with this logo that uh, we've done our due diligence. We've checked our facts, what uh, we put on the, the social media, on the radio, what we said, what we uh, told you on television. It's been checked. and. So Social media brought about this speed, which is going faster even, and it uh, impacts us in the morning. I mean, not too long ago, uh, it was a television uh, report. Uh, well, now we have to tweet, we have to be on social media, they're going to be uh, streaming on radio, there's going to be a uh, newscast at the end of the day. And everything goes very really quickly, uh, depending on the event that has to be covered. And we have to make sure that what we are reporting on is the truth. We have norms, we have standards in Radio Canada Acadie, Radio Canada CBC. So these are journalistic practices that, uh, uh, be it on Twitter, on Twitter, Instagram, or we always have to respect these standards. And that's the way that. Uh, Personally, we always have to come back to the basis, and even if sometimes some people would like us to be faster, the work has to be done at the beginning, and that's what's important, to always uh, make sure we ask the proper questions and to think about them. I worked in English and in French in Rio. I was brought up in Quebec. Uh, I speak English, I speak French, almost equally as well. But I wasn't sure when I sent a tweet if it was proper, was I using proper grammar, was it perfect? I made a mistake and somebody told me, hey, you have to pay attention to this. I mean, we need quality here in Radio Canada. And it really touched me and, uh, and it was the only time that I was asking myself. To myself, be first but be right. Mm -hmm. 
Et après ça, j'ai envoyé, j'ai toujours consulté quelqu'un pour savoir si... And afterwards, I always went to see somebody if things were correct. I thought, okay, obviously, it was uh, okay, but uh, we have always to check, to verify. But you need to be right. And those are practices that we are integrating more and more as we are depending and, and using social media more to get out uh, news and information. You have to. There's, there is no choice. We aren't going to be wrong. We don't want to be incorrect. We don't want to misrepresent. And that's something that we, ha we are still working very hard at when we're trying to get out uh, stories and news. It's funny because on the uh, variety side, it's a totally different problem. For us, it's not a question of being first. Before, public was looking for uh, entertainment. They knew where their, their shows were. They went there and they got it. Now, it's the role of the ones who's doing entertainment or variety to go and find his public through all the different offers that he has. It's the problem of the cat who's playing the piano because uh, the video of a cat who's uh, playing piano, that's a lot of competition today. So we have to find a way to, and yeah, I mean, it's true, we're fighting against things that are, ridiculous, but uh, I, I sometimes I look at cats playing the piano, but we have to find a way to find the audience, uh, but always with the standards of Radio Canada and, and also with the uh, social media, the public always wants to know, wants to get the information, wants even more information, that we have a, an almost a personal relationship, but we still have to establish limits and that's part of the responsibility we have. What's important we have to remember is that uh, there's a double standard. And it's true that uh, people uh, are very strict in a sense with uh, Radio Canada, more so than with uh, private media. And they're right to be that. Uh, uh, but the truth is that yes, we have to have uh, standards like uh, BBC is in Great Britain. And in fact, we also, it's a constraint that we impose upon ourselves, it condemns us to excellence. And that's a good thing, because people uh, want to be, have us be perfect. Uh, I'm, I've worked with uh, people who are impassioned, but who also are perfectionists, and we realize that people, the artisans, the creators also, set the bar very high. It's important to do that and to continue to that. Uh, Yes, and if we don't do that, uh, people will tell us, uh, especially in social media. I mean, we make one little mistake and we're told. And it's something that we appreciate. So it's a feedback that we have, be it uh, for, to tell us uh, something that's uh, kind of a nuance, say. But uh, people, uh, uh, before people would send uh, messages by email or by phone, I receive fewer now. They're going to tell me, uh, they're going to phone me on uh, Twitter or on uh, Instagram, and they say, okay, maybe you might be interested in this. It's a type of feedback, and this uh, correction and this uh, uh, perfect aspect that they're asking for will always have that with us. We always have to uh, adjust rapidly in uh, the variety, uh, but it's always uh, important to put in time to do the writing properly. Uh, we're going to do this. We're going to have time. It's something to you put it on social media. You have 50 hits, uh, and then uh, I mean, you do this, and then uh, somebody falls off uh, out of a tree, and that's uh, 200 million hits, and uh, so. A long time to do that. Sometimes I mean. If you watch the games and you saw a, a reporter speaking after uh, an event, maybe putting it together a story after an event, they sometimes maybe had about five minutes to do that. And that was the case for me. There was one game where we had to meet our deadline. We had no choice. <laughs> so uh, I didn't even write anything down. I stood in front of the camera. I knew what my what the interviews were that were in the story. I did it in under three minutes, and it was sent. I think I did it under two minutes because we clocked it because it was a record. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, and it was sent. But even in that time, we still had to make sure that what we were doing was right and what we were doing was correct so we can push it to all these platforms and not be trolled, as what, they say. What, <laughs> what I've enjoyed most, I think, is the challenge from viewers and from consumers of media through social media to us as reporters about perhaps our perspective on a story, about wherever inaccuracies might uh, exist in a story, 
there is an anger out there. There's a willingness mm -hmm. to help in a sense that New Brunswickers have something to share with us, have something to tell us about. So, you know, the most dramatic effect I've found with the reliance on social media as a reporter uh, and as the host of a, radio, of a television program is how many people are able to get to us to share their stories, much more so than before, where someone would have to actually come into the shop or know a reporter to get their phone number and call them up. And now we get tips on stories from Facebook and through social media in ways that we weren't able to before. So again, I come back to closing that gap between the consumer and us on this stage and improving our ability to reach out to people and have people reach out to us mm -hmm. so that we're able to tell their stories, stories that we might otherwise have missed. The challenge very quickly is when we have immediate feedback and we know what generates clicks, uh, hits, and what pleases people is that before that, Radio Canada imposed a, a schedule of uh, newscasts. So we were uh, reporters and we were judging as to what was important, what was less important, and the, uh, the menu of the uh, news report was on what we thought was important for citizens uh, uh, to inform them. and. Uh, to basically help them uh, make decisions, uh, for example, how to vote uh, in an election. So now we have a different challenge. People choose themselves what they uh, see or listen to. So they're going to click on something that they like, and they're going to get what they want uh, with the Google algorithms. And, and we're in this structure and our challenge is to say yes give them a little bit of what they like because we have to maintain contact with them but not just what they like because for example a child if we just give him just spaghetti and meatballs well he's never going to learn how to uh, appreciate something else for example broccoli is good or is good for his health so the challenge is to find a way of pleasing people with uh, cat videos but at the same time, giving them information which is important for them. And that is the challenge that we have. I mean, we're not alone, but uh, the bar is even higher for Radio-Canada because we have excellence in that domain. Right. When you're in a silo, you've chosen your silo, you know what you like, and all you're seeing and consuming is what's inside of your silo. But the, it is a, a huge challenge, Francois, to, to figure out how to get into that silo and to introduce other, other things. Things sure have changed in a generation. I was just thinking back, you know, I'm staying with my parents in Sackville, and so I'm thinking back to what it was like when I lived there in the 1980s, and I had friends who got the Moncton Times in the morning, and some people got the Moncton transcript in the afternoon, because you wanted to update your news every 12 hours or so. <laughs> and it seems like a long time ago, because it was a long time ago. I have my phone in my hand for two reasons. First of all, to remind the people who are watching online across the country that you can email your questions into us, and the email address for uh, the English questions is apm at cbc.ca, or you can uh, tweet us at hashtag cbcapm, and en français, and uh, in French for email APA uh, at uh, RadioCanada.ca and on platforms, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat or Instagram, it's uh, hashtag RCAPA. writing a note to myself to boost the ratings next week. Apparently cats playing piano is what I need. So <laughs> <laughs> doing cats doing anything. We're doing yeah, it, yeah. Really, okay, really. so next week piano and then maybe xylophone the week after. So <laughs> those news network ratings are going to be through the roof. It's going to be outstanding. So we've been talking here about how uh, social media gives us uh, feedback, for example. It allows us to go very quickly and also to be careful. And, and we touched on something that I want to ask all of you or any of you who want to talk about this a little bit, and that is how... The digital age and social media doesn't have to be something separate and different from what we're doing. And that uh, for me, with a program on CBC News Network, I think back to last December, there was an earthquake, a small earthquake, but pretty significant. It literally woke me up late one night around uh, December 28th, I think it was. And the first thing I did is I turned on the TV. But because it was late at night, none of the TV stations had yet gone live with it. So I went to Twitter. And Twitter can be imperfect in many ways, but it's a great tool for people to report something like, I felt an earthquake, here's how it felt. And then we rushed down to the studio, fired up the machines and uh, started. <laughs> you can see how technical I am. We fired up the machines. <laughs> Somebody did something somewhere. 
<laughs> and I was on the air. That's all I know. And so, you know, Blackberry in hand, and yes, I have a Blackberry, and I'm proud of it. Um, <laughs> and uh, so Blackberry in hand, and uh, simulcast on the radio, and listening to our audience and asking them to send in pictures. And one of the few pictures we had of the earthquake was one of our producers in Ottawa who was able to access her security camera footage in her home in Vancouver and then edited it online and then sent it into us. I mean, that's the world we live in. And, uh, and so you can integrate the digital into what we do. So uh, Harry, you are the uh, sort of do the, sh the, the, the work closest to what I do in, in the yeah. Supper Hour News here in, Vancouver, in Fredericton, and others can speak about it as well. But uh, how do you see the integration of digital into what you do each night? Well, it's been a real challenge because as, as a TV host as I am now, um, there's been a, a re reversal of the hierarchy as we traditionally enjoyed it. For the past 30 years, when a newsroom decided what stories it was going to cover and how it was going to cover those stories, the first thought was, well, what are we going to do for TV? And then there would be this trickle-down effect to radio. Well, that's been flipped on its head, and certainly not unjustifiably, because social media is so fast now that our first reach has to be online. And that means that TV, in a sense, is almost a secondary thought or a tertiary thought. And it's difficult as the host of a show to, to cope with that on a daily basis. You always want to be on the show that's driving the coverage agenda. So what it means is I rely heavily on my digital colleagues. We converse throughout the day on what's moving on digital and what is going to be where the story is going to progress to, how it's going to advance through the course of the day so that by the time 6 o'clock comes on, there is a new story or a new presentation of a story that may have been traveling throughout the day. Um, what we're finding is that social media are very good at describing the what, what happened, who was involved, the fundamental facts, but not so good necessarily at explaining the why. Mm -hmm. So for us, TV, where it's on at 6 o'clock, it is very much appointment viewing, which is less and less common these days. But we draw people to our program by trying to answer the why. Why is this story important? Why does this matter to you? And to garner some of that trust that viewers have had in programs, supper hour programs, for the last few years, that if they do tune in, they're going to find out what's most important in their community. We're still working on integrating more thoroughly the digital side into our programs. And I think all the supper hour shows, we had a meeting just last month in Toronto of all the supper hour hosts across the country to talk about this struggle of, in a sense, having been on top but now being a little further down the, uh, the, the stack of imperatives during the editorial debates of the day. Um, and we're finding that we have to be more aggressive in terms of incorporating digital media and digital coverage into our daily program. So it's a challenge. But, you know, I mean, it's much the challenge that newspapers and radio went through in the late 50s, early 60s, when this wonder box appeared in the world that could telegraph uh, photo images to people's living rooms and the advent of television. It was a similar challenge. That's where we are now. And uh, how we go forward in the next uh, few months and few years is going to be really imperative in terms of keeping those audiences interested, interested in what we're doing and trusting that model that we see on the floor. Ben, justement là-dessus, j'aimerais aller à la prochaine. On that, I would like to go to the next generation because Harry says that television is uh, less and less uh, a priority. Uh, the younger people are more and more disconnected, disconnected with television, but they're much more connected with phones and tablets. Samuel, you've uh, spoken with a lot of young people. So what are your ideas as to how to go reach them, to bring them to the beacon, to the lighthouse, but also at the same time to find out uh, what they know and what they want to know about? We have a couple, little bit of an idea as to what the solution is. We have to give them room, uh, the tools, the opportunity to express themselves and express themselves in their manner because, I mean, we don't... Uh, discuss or analyze uh, as youth do. Uh, they do it their own way and in a way that uh, belongs to them. 
they are so good at being concise, at being clear and precise because they're doing, they're making videos of 10, 15 seconds. They're uh, telling stories on Instagram. They use the social media that uh, us dinosaurs, we dinosaurs don't even know about. Um, I mean, I'm talking to these kids, I've learned. I had no idea what they were ta telling about and they had to explain it to me. And every time, I had to, I was surprised to find out how it works. If you think Facebook is one of the uh, best things, no. That's the dinosaur thinking. There's other things too, but the youth are, I mean, somewhere else totally. They tell stories totally differently. And that's part of our challenge. We have to learn how to tell our stories in a different way. Uh, and it's the same thing in creation and in uh, uh, journalists. This is a good story for television. This is a good story for the web. This is a good story for such and such a web. Uh, place. We have to learn how to tell stories differently uh, with a different rhythm, different vocabulary, and we're learning slowly, but we have to continue to uh, speak with these youth, uh, and we have to give them the opportunity to educate us. Maybe it's a little weird to say that, but they have to educate us. If I could give a part of an element of it, to a question that I asked earlier and how uh, involve people who are on video chats and to involve them in something that's essential. I think Samuel is, uh, uh, gives part of an answer and I want to add to it. I think that um, the choice of the stories that we tell has to be the same because what's important is always the same thing. Afterwards, it's how we tell the story. That's what's more important. And I believe that uh, my recipe, and it's always uh, worked well, the people are interested in the human adventure. We're not interested in figures. If I talk about something that I've covered a lot since uh, last fall, the migrant crisis across Europe, if we cover the crisis in uh, using statistics, figures, one million migrants who crossed uh, countries, uh, uh, Europe uh, to get to Germany, a million people, we have hard time imagining what a million people on the roads look like. But if we say that there's a refugee camp that's welcoming 200,000 people, it's hard to imagine what it could look like. Uh, so what we want to know, what, what do these people look like? Who are they? And that is the choice that we had to tell the story of uh, a family of Mr. Mohammed, and this is his wife, Fatima, and that's what we choose. We choose one person, one family, and we tell the story through that person. So that means we have faces on a drama that was uh, anonymous. In instead of having a, a wave of migrants and the amounts, of, so we present individuals. Yes, we make choices, but we, we tell a human story. And when we do that, uh, we win every time because we're interested and we're going to feel uh, empathy uh, for people who look like us. It's not a threat, this uh, uh, wave of people. It's uh, say the same people like us. They want to have their children in a safe environment and all of a sudden, yes, uh, communication is established with uh, our listeners or our uh, viewers. And I think that we, re I felt it, uh, that uh, my role was important when I told this story of the migrants uh, on, all the way on the other side of the world. And even if we're in a, uh, in a uh, electoral campaign full swing, uh, even though there was the reports on the migraine crisis that uh, was the first item on the Telejournal because people understood that and uh, we kept the same type of agenda, the same type of hierarchy in the news. We had the courage to open the news report on this because so that people could understand that it was important and uh, the story was followed. Uh, people really felt that uh, this story was important and they asked for more. Uh, locally, I think also that this uh, example can be exported everywhere because at the Telejournal Acadie or on the web or Radio Canada Acadie, stories that uh, end up by changing policies, uh, stories that touch people are stories where someone represents what is going on, what the problem is, or even just somebody who comes and tells uh, their own personal story that is a unique story. But uh, I mean, 
in the long run, everybody is living through that type of situation. So this story that uh, Jean-François told, we could uh, have told it with diagrams and pictures, but in the end, it's uh, a person who came to tell their own story, and a lot of people are going to be uh, impacted, and then uh, public policies are going to be impacted. Uh, media, but there's also a lot of audio um, that is, you know, becoming more, you know, digital. Look at what CBC's done with podcasts over the last few years. It's been hugely successful for CBC. Um, you know, I was told there was an intern that worked with us about, you know, about five or six years ago, probably uh, maybe even longer than that, but I think eight years ago. And uh, he was working with me, and, and he wasn't very happy about it. And I asked him why. He said, well, radio's going to die anyway. <laughs> and I'm still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> so I still have a job. Um, but, but it's not, because we're finding new ways to reach people. And because of this on-demand society where we, we are in an age where we can get whatever content we want whenever we want, podcasts answer that. And they're hugely popular. Look at NPR's podcasts that have had so much success as well. So we're not just talking about visual media when we're talking about digital media. It's also the audio that we are doing really well at and that we continue to invest in that actually, and, and it's, it's a lot of fun and, and a lot of a pleasure to work on for those kinds of things. Well, thank you very much. When you think about it, it's from radio to television to digital, from sports to entertainment, from refugee stories to stories in New Brunswick, it is still about the message even with the new media, right? And it's about a message that Radio Canada, CBC can tell and that we can live up to the brand that we've all, all helped create and it's really important to us. So thank you very, very much for being part of this conversation. It was fascinating for me. We still did not answer the Saint Hubert Swiss chalet <laughs> question. <laughs> we'll do that after. We but, know the uh, answer. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you very much. And I encourage you to continue this conversation. Remember, one of the things we talked about, about the beauty of digital, is the interaction. And we're looking forward to your interaction, not just questions to ask our next group of guests, but also uh, some reaction to what you heard here and how to uh, better tell us how to tell stories to Canadians. So please do continue to tweet and uh, email us. Well, conversation was interesting. We could have uh, continued it for a long time. We're starting to find uh, possibilities of solutions. We can see that uh, Radio Canada, uh, the work, the journalistic work, remains the same, but uh, in a different type of environment. So you can tell us what uh, you expect from CBC Radio Canada in this uh, digital age how we can reinforce the relations with Canadians, and you can share questions, comments with the uh, hashtag RCAPA. So we already have a question. I'm going to invite our uh, senior executives to uh, come here and sit down on the stage. We have a first question for Hubert Lacroix. And just before you uh, ask the question, I'll go through the list of people who will come up here. Uh, so Hubert, uh, again, uh, is up here. Remy Racine, our, the chair of our board. Also Louis Lalonde, the uh, vice president of uh, Service Francais. Uh, Richard, uh, Richard Simmons, who is the director of Radio Canada Acadie and also the senior managing director for The Atlantic, uh, Denise Wilson, also on the stage. Heather Conway, the uh, vice president for English services, was scheduled to be here. Uh, she unfortunately had a change of schedule, a last minute change of schedule, and is not able to be here. But this is the second part of our reality digital show as you get to ask these men and women any question you want about the CBC. And uh, we are already getting some, actually maybe not any question, but anyway. Um, and we invite people on the floor here in Moncton to, uh, to ask questions. And uh, we are also getting questions already emailed to us. Alors, je vous rappelle, uh, en anglais, Sorry, mind you, in English, it's APM. At cbc.ca for your questions. Dot CBC, ACA. radio And in French, Radio Canada at uh, CBC. So the first question is for Hubert Lacroix, President. This uh, uh, digital curve is going to happen uh, at the expense of other uh, media. La réponse, la réponse, uh, the answer dans un environnement comme in an environment like ours, it is very clear. We cannot, le Canada tout entier, with uh, uh, Canada as a whole, uh, CBC, Radio Canada, and uh, Canada has 
such deep roots. We cannot forget radio and television, whereas there are a lot of the 87 people, 80%, 87 percent of the person look at uh, uh, television. Uh, what we're looking to do is to be more present uh, and to uh, create this link that was uh, that is much more that is important. I think you uh, started to talk about this uh, relationship, this link that we're trying to create through our uh, digital presence. We were saying, for example, in Moncton, the digital page in Moncton, the web page, instead of being refreshed uh, eight to 12 times a day, is going to be refreshed. Uh, eight to 12 times an hour uh, to give you news that is going to help us to deliver the local contact content in all the uh, regions of Canada. Uh, and this is certainly not against the old media, but uh, it's going to help lead the uh, people towards the new digital who is uh, watching us in Georgian Bay. This is an easy question. You should have no problem with this. CBC provides public broadcasting that reflects the culture of radio, as Canadians have learned to expect from it. I say that as a 70-year-old listener who has always enjoyed the music and entertainment I get from uh, CBC Radio 1 and 2. It was commonplace in the home where I was brought up to uh, listen to that uh, in my living room in various spaces. Here's the question. What are you going to do to keep my interest, my 70-year-old interest, and yet appeal to millenniums who have not had the exposure with music and humor uh, that I've been attracted to? If you, <laughs> easy question. If you look at um, what CBC has been doing on the music side, trying to reinvent itself um, by being, um, by, by being so such a platform for new musicians, for, for Canadian music across the country. Look at what we just did for Tra Tragically Hip. Across all ages, across the country. CBC Radio-Canada, on its platform, if you look at um, the new digital porthole for music that we've just created, where we have um, all sorts of Canadian music exposed in high-profile environments. That's what we continue doing. We are going to continue doing this, and I think that this music is more accessible than ever. And, uh, uh, for example, in français. For instance, in French, maybe you can talk about this. Yeah, I'll help you out a bit. <laughs> La musique, est un très bon music is a good example because animé, we're always de de Radio -Canada, que ce motivated soit. Radio Canada or CBC in music and in other fields. It's its great diversity. By now being able to use all the digital platforms that we have, we can even diversify even more our content. I'll give you an example. Opera at CBC is done live. We put this on the web and on the radio six hours later. So with this, we doubled, but really doubled our audience for opera in French. So this is a simple lesson. This gives us opportunities to offer more. In classical music, we have seven or eight streams that are accessible by category. So indeed, we have more possibilities. And you said something, Hubert, that's very important. We have to make sure that we accompany our changing audiences. The audiences can be more demanding. They have more possibilities. But that's what we are experiencing now. So questions now from the floor? Please introduce yourself, even though I know you, René Cormier. I'm the chair of the Acadian National Society. We're very pleased to have you here. I would like to welcome you here. I'll ask my question, and I'll try to explain quickly the reason for this question. What will be the impact of these new platforms, digital ones, on the content of traditional platforms like television and radio? And how will a link take place between these contents that we get from new media and the content that we see on television and on radio, which are, of course, products that we continue to listen to? So my question is the following. Of course, we can go on the web, on the net, and see Acadian production, in my case. We can see this. But when we move towards television, we have regional television. But when we go to national television, 
qui est un vaste communicant avec le Which is a way we communicate with other platforms, right? Because how, what's the link? You know. We won't repeat what was said. But on television, on national television, often we don't find ourselves present on that television because we're not present. So when it comes to content, for us, the digital issue is fundamental for two reasons. First of all, yes, we see this as a beacon. It is a light because the content is examined rigorously. But we identify also to this beacon. And what's at stake for us is how new content in traditional platforms. And the question, please? Yes, the question is, how will you see this transformation from content on the national level at CBC, how will this, how can Canadians and Francophones who watch national television can see a platform in which they can recognize themselves and see something of themselves? So Louis will talk about what we did when it comes to the news to reflect where of your concerns to reflect our regional content. And I'll ask Richard to make a link between what the content coming out of New Brunswick and can be found on various platforms thanks to the digital technology. So thank you for the question. The question of identity is always an essential one. It's essential for an Acadian and it's also essential for all Francophones and even more so today because with all the content to which we have access is huge. It's not to frighten you, but you have 18% of Francophones who are on Netflix, and you know the Francophone content on Netflix is uh, limited, and it's not from our country, it's not from here. So that issue is a fundamental one, and we have to work on this issue, and continue to do so, and seriously, we're making efforts on all levels Hubert was talking about news, but I'd like to talk about something I'm very proud of, is the way Acadian artists have contributed greatly, and I think we should celebrate this. We're developing on two series. We never would have imagined that two years ago. We would wish it, but we couldn't do it. Now we can do it. On CBC Radio Canada, there are some stories that are stories written by Acadians and acted by Acadians and soon produced by Acadian productions. So that's interesting. So in information, there's a lot of news, there's a lot of things taking place. But Richard, you can add perhaps, but we could continue with this discussion. But know this this is a constant concern, and it's by working together on specific issues. That's how we will be able to improve the content. If I could add something, I find there's great potential with everything digital because Hubert, in his speech, talked about our experiences during the Grand Tintamar in Caraquet. We decided to do this on Facebook Live, this Tintamar, and we reached out to more than 145,000 people, and it's an audience which went beyond Acadia's borders. We had comments from Africa, from Europe, and comments from the United States and elsewhere in the country. And that was one of our goals when we decided to do this. One, we want to bring together Acadians that are scattered throughout the planet and also initiate people who perhaps didn't know what a Tintama was. So it was a really a great opportunity for us to reach a lot of people, we reached a lot more people than had we done so traditionally. I understand your question, though. At the same time, we're doing digital work. Our traditional media, radio, television remain important anchors, especially in Acadia. So we take care of those. And at the network, what we have to do, and Louis talked about this, how perhaps we work differently to make sure that this reflection can be seen in the mainstream. We have to be part of this main dialogue on a daily basis. I think the work that we've done here in most regions with our network 
Euh, il y a eu un travail phénoménal qui a été fait. Excellent work done, and we've had a lot of progress. When it comes to television, we talked about this. We're developing series, television series, and we're developing content that allow us to have to be heard with Uber. We met young people, young Acadians, and they were saying, "We want to hear our accents." And yes, we have to hear their accents. We have to hear their voices in our programming. And we're working on this. But I think what we're doing with the digital issue, there's an opportunity allowing us to really go beyond certain obstacles. So this should be beneficial. So I thank you very much. And I invite you that I believe the Acadian National Society, we could be a key stakeholder to continue to dialogue on the future of CBC Radio-Canada and what you can do with these new media and television and radio. And I find in Moncton, we have great facilities. And perhaps it'd be great that this becomes a laboratory to decentralize national production. This would be a great place to do production and to do national production here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you. We'll go to a question coming from someone on the net for Hubert Lacroix. Of the $675 million announced by the federal government in their budget, how much money will be invested directly in the region compared to what will be invest, invested in Montreal? So let's be clear. Yes, it's $675 million over five years. So the first amount of money, $75 million this year and $150 million in next year. So the money will be invested, as we said. First of all, we'll continue to go digital as we've started to make sure that all our initiatives can continue. And also, we have some important issues when it comes to everything that you see, you know, what's being rebroadcasted on television and uh, on radio, on television. And this is where a number of dollars will go. Ensuite, on veut améliorer notre and we want to improve our presence in the regions, everything that's called local. So that's why you've heard many of our individuals and our speakers to talk about it's important to be digital in the region for 18 hours during the day, seven days a week, something that we didn't have in the past. So these monies will work on this in the short term to improve the quality of our content, to reach out and create ties with Canadians in a more obvious way, and continue with this digital change. For a question, and then email, and then the floor again. So, uh, sir. Jacques Verge, Kaplan, Acadie, Cape Spear, New Brunswick, for the CBC. But vos platforms Your platforms, I fully agree with the digital, digital change. Half the time, I love your platforms. The other half, no. And I'll tell you why I don't like them half the time is because in many regions of the province and in other provinces, we don't all have access to high-speed internet. And my concern and my question is, how will you do this and not forget those who don't or don't are not on high-speed internet? Some of us are using slow speed, you know. So thank you. So, we I'll try, and then I'll answer part of the question. We're very aware that we still have audiences that don't have access to these technologies. That's why we continue to invest in our radio and television so that you can continue to listen to us in a more traditional fashion. But obviously, we're very much aware that most people are interested in digital platforms. Most people have smart phones and tablets, and we have to be there with the content. All I would add is that be sure that we never miss an opportunity to, to tell the government that this is at stake. Every time we travel in the country, we see this. I've traveled throughout this country. This issue always come, is always being raised. It's improving, but not fast enough, especially not when a public broadcaster is moving towards the digital era. So we all have issues with this. We have to say it. It's, a st it's an issue, but be certain that we mention this on a regular basis because it's part of the reality. 
I focus on technology. I think we're working a lot on technologies that make our videos easier to be uh, accessed. It's fairly technical, but we've made a lot of progress. I find the speed of our sites is improving constantly. And obviously, one day, sites will be more accessible to people who don't have high speed. But I agree with you. It's an issue. So an email question next, and then we'll go to the floor. An email question is for Remy. Uh, as you head into your final year as chair of CBC Radio Canada, could you share a few things uh, which have stood out for you during your tenure? Well, uh, a few things. Uh, first of all, we went, uh, uh, in my five years, we went from cutting, cutting, cutting to getting finally uh, some uh, good news uh, uh, on the budget side. So it, uh, it is better uh, now at, uh, at the board than uh, um, to uh, manage what we, the budgets and uh, the, the big uh, items um, that the board uh, looks at. Um, it's also uh, um, for me. Uh, um, it's been uh, it's been a good uh, it's been a great five years because I saw the evolution of the of the company from uh, from five years ago. I was even here uh, nine years ago. So uh, all the, the changes we've made I've, 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 I'm, uh, are paying right now. I've, I see even in the what the, when the some reporters said the, s some things that I, I've heard today. Big change from what I heard six years ago in in panels, uh, from where we were to where we're, we're, we're going. So, the um, to me, uh, it's the, the the CBC is going on a path that is uh, uh, very exciting. And uh, and I, I was part of the but well, not part, but I was I witnessed all those changes over the years. So it's been very interesting uh, for me. On va prendre une question de la salle. We're going to take a question from the uh, hall here. A little bit of a preamble, and then the question, please. Je m'appelle Philomène. Hi, my name is Philomène. Ma question est d'abord, je vais commencer d'abord par... I'm going to start by uh, thanking Votre message uh, était Mr. Hubert. Your message was well structured, and I really liked it because it uh, touched me personally. I see that you uh, really consider the diversity. Uh, that is important for Canada. And the video that you showed was proof that uh, we are a, a diversified country by its population, and you represent it very well. My question is this. Uh, in this era with the media, are we not projecting ourselves as uh, racial minorities in, in New Brunswick? We are... 5,000 people of the black race in uh, New Brunswick who are the first majority group of racial minority in New Brunswick. Your question, please. My question is, is how do you think that the traditional media do not represent us? We don't see ourselves in it. We are not represented. How do you think that the uh, digital changes uh, we'll make it so that we can see ourselves in these new media. Richard, I'm going to ask you to talk about uh, New Brunswick and how important it is in uh, New Brunswick diversity. Diversity in, in, and how you see that in New Brunswick and the Atlantic provinces. And I'll end uh, with my comment to show how important uh, diversity is important for us with the uh, enterprise. Thank you, first of all, for the question, Madame Philomène. So obviously, it's uh, something that's a concern for us. We try to reflect everything that goes on in the region. We've had already conversations uh, on that uh, subject, and we try to take into consideration, for example, in a uh, show like Formal Libre, which is a show that uh, treats uh, subjects, and on a regular basis, we have discussions on issues that touch particularly uh, on diversity. For example, over the last uh, months, last uh, year, uh, we talked about uh, refugees. So it was something that was very important, and we tried to cover it, not exclusively. It's not only uh, on uh, diversity, but it's certainly uh, a concern for the uh, team that works on the show. Also, on uh, Sam, uh, Saturday morning, we have Saspasisi. It happens, it's going on here, and that's on the communities in a general sense, whether they are racial communities, and we wanted to get closer to the community. And the team that works uh, on that show has the mandate to 
present on a weekly basis something that comes from diversity in the four Atlantic provinces. And it's something that uh, we're aware of, we're working on it. Maybe it's not perfect, but we're working on it, and we're going to be continuing in that direction because it's very important. Yeah, we also in Atlantic Canada recognize we could do a better job, no question. Uh, we um, certainly are looking at our diversity um, in our hiring um, and reflecting and ensuring that our people um, are from the communities that we uh, report on and tell the stories about. And it's something that is a priority for us uh, in Atlantic Canada. We've recently hired um, a number of people in Nova Scotia from the uh, Nova Scotia African community. And we are telling and seeing even the results of that in a very p short period of time. We're very happy about that. Il est, il est absolument... It's absolutely impossible for a public broadcaster to tell stories to its different audiences if we don't, uh, if we're not aware of the audience. So we know that it's important. We have figures, we have commitments everywhere, but we have to do more. Because if you go to Vancouver, Toronto, the population has changed. And the people who are speaking to them, the people with whom they are interacting, have to be people who understand us. And we realize this, the speed at which these changes are happening from most of our opinions, it, it, it's not quick enough. So more and more we're trying to uh, represent or reflect our audiences, not only through the people who are hosts, but also through the people who work on a daily basis in our organizations. For example, uh, women. Uh, we're okay. We have, uh, I guess, 49 or 50 percent of employees of Radio Canada who are women. So there's a, an intelligent, a good balance. Uh, made up. In our workforce. But beyond that, we have to reflect Canada as a whole in uh, our programming and in the delivery of our services. You've been very patient and uh, your turn to ask a question. Um, okay, my name is Joni Seashell. I live in Moncton. I've been here 44 years. My question regards the repeat broadcasts mm. that are so, so frequent. Yes. And very, I, as I said, I've Although I have access to podcasts, I still prefer CBC Radio. And I've, no, I've looked very often, I will, uh, I will be waiting for an ideas program, and then I will realize partway in that I'd heard it years ago. Why are the initial broadcast dates not indicated on the schedules on uh, when I go online to check what are the up, what what are the upcoming programs, because I'll hear things that I know I've heard ten or fifteen years ago, yeah. and I want to know, I want to know that, then I won't go back, or I will wonder what has happened since then. Why is there no update? And there's the Maritime Atlantic program on Sunday morning on the radio. They will always announce that this is a rebroadcast of such and such a time, and I think that is very important for us to know because we can follow the story and encourage updates. Thank you very much. Um, Madam, oui. I absolutely agree with what you just said. There's no reason for that not to be happening, and we will pick this up. Thank you very much. Well, that was easy. <laughs> now we have a question. I'm trying to turn my phone on. It was... Uh, off, because uh, the answer was long. For Denise Wilson, the uh, director of uh, CBC in uh, in the Maritimes, and it has to do with three small provinces, kind of dominated by the biggest of the three, Nova Scotia. This is somebody from Riverview, New Brunswick, uh, saying, I believe that New Brunswick and the views of New Brunswickers are virtually unknown, Denise, to the majority of Canadians in other provinces. It's sometimes called the drive-through province. All programs which are of regional interest originate in Halifax. Can you think of one province west of the Maritimes which would accept the idea of being dependent on an adjacent province for CBC services? <laughs> so, <laughs> the drive-through province. The drive-through province. Well, I'll I'll just in in um, Hubert touched on this in his his opening uh, speech is that the reach that we now have through digital and the stories and content that we provide on our digital platforms, with over one million visits per week, 
uh, allows uh, certainly the content from New Brunswick to be seen uh, by a whole lot more people than in the past on our traditional broadcasts. Um, we have, uh, I'll remind, uh, I believe this is a, obviously someone from New Brunswick, that we do have three local morning shows in New Brunswick. We have in Moncton, Fredericton, St. John. We have four locations. We have our uh, bureau in Bathurst with our VJ uh, Bridget. And um, our folks uh, also do drive shows. Four, there are four drive shows uh, each day. We have our television newscast, and uh, some of our programming through the day comes from Halifax and the Maritime Noon Show. It uh, does, however, have a half hour dedicated to call-in, which is available to everyone in the Maritimes to call with their questions uh, or, or voice their um, their opinions. So uh, it, is, it is available, even though it does come from Halifax, too. Uh, the rest of the region. But daily programs do come from and originate from New Brunswick. Alors, uh, il y a moins de cinq minutes. So there's less than uh, five minutes. So we're going to take more questions. Voilà, au plan. Je suis encore, je suis encore un consommateur de télévision. I'm still a television viewer and I'm happy for the uh, refinancing from the Trudeau government. But when I see the amount of advertising, I'm wondering if uh, we're uh, on the way to getting a free uh, state uh, television uh, that would be free of advertising. That model is not available yet. You know that uh, CBC Radio is uh, funded by the government, $20 billion a year, and then there's 300 to 400 million dollars that come from our own efforts to complete our uh, service delivery. If uh, you look at uh, the way we deliver uh, programming, the amount of minutes on, in television that you have in Advertise You uh, obviously helps to deliver those services. I wouldn't say that we have uh, fewer than uh, commercial or private uh, uh, stations, but it's an issue that uh, we have to work with. So we're uh, experiencing things where uh, uh, moving things around, we have certain uh, programs that uh, have no advertising. For example, the Tragically Hip concert is an example. We're very aware of the number of minutes that uh, we have, and uh, we're looking to uh, minimize them. Uh, we have a question from uh, for Louis Lalande. How do francophones outside of Quebec, how will they benefit uh, in refunding in the regions? All our stations are going to be benefiting. The answer is very clear. Our regional approach, uh, be it for Moncton or Ontario or in the West, all stations will benefit because we all have the same objective, that is to make sure that our television and our radio continue to offer essential services that they're offering now and to make sure that uh, the digital will work with the funding seven days out of seven, uh, 24 hours a day, and to continue to offer an opportunity to artisans, uh, the creators, uh, independent production, for example. In Moncton, there are quite a few, and, and there are some a uh, little bit everywhere. So be sure that uh, there won't be any leftovers. No pressure. Last question to you. So it's more of a comment than a question. Are you aware that sometimes Radio Canada, Moncton, is just Radio Canada Moncton. An example, last uh, summer, there was a big show in Beersville in the uh, county of Kent uh, on the radio or television. We said that there's a big show in the uh, Moncton region. Oh, Kent is not uh, uh, the greater Moncton area. I'm sorry. <laughs> Your comment is, makes me smile because we've had this uh, conversation with the 10 young folks with whom 
that we saw last night, uh, Richard mentioned it, and we were saying that uh, what New Brunswick was representing, and we were saying that New Brunswick is more than Moncton, in the sense that in Canada there's more than Montreal or Toronto. So uh, this perception often exact that uh, we are centered around the big urban centers, and we're trying with our uh, programming to fragment this because that's why we have uh, offices a little bit everywhere. We can't be a public broadcaster without being in the all, all the regions and to have an audience that follows us. So, thank you. So there are other questions that are coming to us. We have to stop here. We have no longer, no more time, but questions uh, have been asked. We'll uh, have the answers on the uh, website, uh, cbcradio.ca, APA. Uh, they'll be there within a week. So thank you very much for your participation, all of you, and in the hall here, and people on the internet. Thank you very much for, uh, for answering all those questions in the ways that you did. Thanks to those of you here in Moncton who uh, uh, attended but also asked questions and also those of you across the country, including that gentleman who's sitting, I'm just imagining, on his uh, deck overlooking Georgian Bay uh, with his laptop uh, on and uh, watching us from there. So to all of you who joined us digitally, thank you very much. And if you have other questions, there's a reception. We invite you to stay here, those who are here. Obviously, those online, it's a little more difficult. But if you have questions, you'll be able to continue with the key click, the hashtags, CBCRCA, and you'll be able to continue with discuss with the people here. Thank you very much once again. Have a good evening.